on. As we continue on this evening, you will hear from two keynote speakers, and it is an honor to introduce the first. Born and raised in New York City, she's been immersed in the international community surrounding the United Nations. She's no stranger to innovation and the power of what young people do, as she began her career as a molecular biologist at the tender age of 13 with her first laboratory job. Now, since then, she's honed her skills as a television producer, as a science journalist, and she has consulted over 150 companies and industrial leaders from sectors from economics to agriculture. Today, she is the founder and CEO of Metabolic, and it's an organization that's focused on circular economies and looking at them from a bottom-up approach. They have done some truly tremendous work, and I'm sure she'll share some of it with you today. So here to speak with us on tonight's theme of healthy urban living, please join me in welcoming, with your biggest campus party round of applause, Ms. Ava Gladick. Thank you. Well, great, thanks for that welcome. And I have to say, I've never followed a dancing robot in any speech I've ever given, so it's quite an act to uh, continue after. Um, so what I've asked, been asked to speak about today is indeed this uh, broader theme behind the Campus Party event this year, which is healthy urban living. And for me, what that translates to is really sustainable, circular, resilient cities, because health is an integral part of that. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about. Um, also, a little bit of a personal story about how I came to work in this sector and um, how Metabolic evolved a vision around uh, cities and the kind of work that we've done in that field. Um, so first of all, yes, I, I've already been introduced. I'm the CEO and founder of um, Metabolic. Um, Metabolic is what we call a uh, systems consulting and clean technology development firm. I started the company around four years ago in Amsterdam. And um, I started it out of a personal frustration because I had been working in uh, sustainability consulting for quite some time, so giving advice to different people, um, you know, coming up with designs or recommendations or analyses, and then watching as this advice would end up in a report and uh, on someone's desk collecting dust. And I knew that there was so much urgency around sustainability, and I thought, why is nobody actually doing stuff? You, we have all the solutions, we have all these great ideas, we're coming up with new technologies, but no one's actually doing it. And so Metabolic was originally conceived as a kind of action agency, so a place where we could actually implement uh, the ideas that we would find. So we have two offices. Um, one of them is in Amsterdam, uh, our headquarters, where we have an experimental farm and uh, a lot of other stuff I'm going to show you guys. And the other one is in Jamaica, um, where we are actually, we have our community fab lab and our foundation headquartered there. And um, actually, the, the, re the way Metabolic works um, to actually get things done is through a kind of pipeline. So we have three divisions. We have a consulting division, a technologies division, and a ventures division. And in the consulting division, we do a lot of analysis to understand where the problems are and where we can solve them. We actually then feed the uh, sort of key problems that we find into our tech division, where we can do R&D. And then when we find something that's really effective and scalable, uh, we can put it into our ventures division, where we can actually uh, come up with scalable solutions. So here, just as a, a little bit of a teaser, um, this is one of the kinds of graphics that we make in our in consulting division. This actually shows all of the material flows, so all of the resource extraction done by humans on the planet Earth for the year 2010. So you can see here all of the resource flows coming from different parts of the world. It's a sand key diagram, so that means the, the lines are actually scaled to the thickness of the, the size of the flows. And right down, oops, I wanted to go. <laughs> I wanted to click a different button. So right down here where you see this tiny little line, that's recycling. So out of all this stuff that we're extracting every year, we recycle that little line. And this is why we have to do something about this. So if you were to guess, I'm not going to ask you guys because this is a huge audience, but um, the total amount of materials that we're extracting, not including water, is equivalent to 130,000 Empire State buildings a year. And it's increasing every year. So that's some of the work that we do in our consulting division. In our tech division, we do a lot of experimentation and applied stuff. And I'm actually going to focus on that a lot in, in the uh, presentation. 
Uh, so I'm not going to get into that. But then in our ventures division, that's where we really can scale things up. And so this is our first venture, for example, Spectral Utilities, um, with one of their first products. So this is a, a um, solar transformer. It's, a, it's actually like a, um, a container-sized solar plant, power plant, that you can put anywhere and replace a diesel generator. So this is the kind of stuff that we're doing um, in our uh, company. So that was just to give you an intro about what we're doing so that you understand the context. And so as uh, Holly already introduced, I was actually planning on becoming a molecular biologist when I was growing up. This was something that my parents instilled in me um, from the time that I was little. They were like, you're going to be the next Marie Curie. And so that was, that was the idea. I, and I actually really loved biology. I uh, started to take genetics courses at Columbia University in New York. Um, and I went on to college to get a degree in molecular genetics. And while I was there, I had a lot of ex experience growing bacteria in flasks. So I would grow a lot of E. coli, and I would watch the exponential growth curve of the bacteria. And I would always be fascinated at how the fact uh, that for the first 23 and a half hours after I would inoculate a flask of bacteria, the flask would look like it was empty. But then in the last half hour, uh, it would go from half empty to, uh, you know, full, basically, in the last five minutes. And that's the, the magic of exponential growth. You're doubling every time you have a cycle. And I knew that this was uh, a thing. I had witnessed it many times myself. So when I ran into these graphs um, while I was in college, I had a pretty big shock, because all of these graphs are following the exponential growth pattern that you see um, in, in bacterial growth. And as I knew with bacteria, the, the last five minutes bef between when the flask was full and the next doubling, all the bacteria died because they had no more resources to consume. So what you can see up here are graphs that basically represent all the key resources and different parameters that are essential for human life and well-being on this planet. All of them are growing exponentially. And all of them started around 1950. So this is what's called, let's say, the great acceleration by some scientists. It's when we really started to have noticeable impact on the major resource flows on the planet. And um, one of the things that you know in nature is that whenever you see something like this, a positive feedback loop, it is going to crash at some point or self-correct. So I saw this and I was like, wow, uh, I need to be doing something else with my life because if I stay in this lab, I'm never going to have an impact on what's going on here. So that was the reason that I got into sustainability in the first place, and I've been searching for better and better ways to have more rapid impact ever since. And so with Metabolic, what we do is actually we look at the world as a system, and we try to figure out, well, where are the places that we can intervene so that we can have a massive exponential impact as quickly as possible? Um, so we actually look for what are called leverage points. So that's a small place, uh, like a, an Achilles heel or something like that, where you can have a little change that has a big effect. And in a lot of our analysis, what we've come up with is um, that cities are indeed a key leverage point. So uh, most of you have seen these pictures. This is a slum that's creeping up onto a formal city. Um, by 2050, 3 billion people are expected to be living in slums, which are basically communities that don't have access to sufficient uh, water, sanitation, or shelter. Um, so this is an increasing trend. And there's something very unique about cities. They're actually a very small part of the total surface area of the planet. It's only 3%. But they're responsible for 80% of GDP, 90% of innovation, um, around 50% uh, of global waste generation, 60 to 80% of greenhouse gas emissions. So, so this is really the definition of a leverage point. It's a small place where if you just change the design of that 3% of the world's surface, you could have a, dra a dramatic effect on how uh, the human story is really unfolding. And what we're actually, you know, the, these exponential growth curves, we do have a chance to shift them in a different direction. And so below here, what you see is, uh, a schematic showing the metabolism of cities. So we're really very much stuck in a linear model where cities are now the drain of all these resources that are harvested from around the world. They come into the cities, they, they get processed into basically garbage, and then they, they leave. So this is a design problem, and we can actually get around this by thinking about urban design in a fundamentally different way. So the model that we've, a lot of us have been focusing on, and something that's very popular in the Netherlands, because it's, it's quite a 
succinct model is moving away from a, uh, from a linear economy, so that's what we, we see with this global material flow and the city model, to uh, a circular economy. So basically, recovering resources um, along the chain into valuable use. So you're designing a system that works more like an ecosystem. If you go into a forest, all the different sort of resources are never actually becoming waste. They're becoming food for other things, and it's a continuous cycle. So why can't we design our actual material economy that way? It's not, it shouldn't be rocket science, right? Um, so with metabolic, we've actually come up with some principles um, or, or actually performance criteria for what should be happening in a circular economy, because it's not just about materials. Um, it's also about uh, dealing with materials correctly. So for example, if you recycle all e-waste, but you have little children do it by hand, that's still not a circular economy. That's not what you want. Um, so you need to actually make sure that you're taking care of all the other uh, things that we want to take care of. So we have these seven sort of performance criteria, and of course the first one is that materials are cycled indefinitely by design, but also other things like strengthening human health and well-being, generating multiple forms of value, and also regenerating ecosystems and natural capital. So when all of this is achieved through a system design, we've uh, become part of a circular economy. And on a city level, of course, because we're talking about this spatially, it's not just that um, you want to cycle all materials um, at any given point. You, you actually want um, the most common materials to cycle on the slowest, uh, lowest uh, geographical space, but rare materials, like those in electronics, can actually be cycled further out. So we've defined this kind of circular city model, which, which shows where materials should be cycled, ideally, in a geographic realm. So getting to actually the applied work that we've been doing in this whole uh, circular economy, circular city space. Uh, when I started Metabolic four years ago, like I said, the first thing uh, I wanted to do was create this awesome office space for the company that would represent our ideals. So I had this vision of, okay, why don't we have an office space where we have a biogas generator and we pr process all our organic waste there and we have aquaponics so we can grow fish and plants and actually to have people take breaks from their screens and be able to, to really show how all of this stuff works in practice. And I met these architects um, in Amsterdam who said, hey, we might have a place for you to put your fantasy office. And I said, that's great. So they told me about this project that they were applying for. Uh, the city had actually a plot of land here in Amsterdam North. So this is Amsterdam. This is the center of the city. And a kilometer by bike in the north there was this empty plot of land that was po polluted and um, basically full of garbage. And the city said, someone can use this for 10 years, come up with a good idea. Um, so this is actually where the site is um, for, of this plot of land. And so with these architects, uh, what they did was they, they came up with uh, what I think was quite a brilliant idea to um, use plants to clean the polluted soil, so phytoremediation, and then to actually use houseboats, so whole buildings that were going to be thrown away because they were old, um, and upcycle them and put them on the land as offices, and, uh, you, and, and have this 10-year temporary development. And the project was called the Kovel. And so when I told these architects about my idea for this office, they were like, well, we, we really need that for the entire site. We need to make this in a, a super sustainable site. So what we did with Metabolic was actually design the concept for making the whole site uh, a clean technology playground. So we decided that we wanted to actually see what we could do with as little money as possible, with uh, as few sort of resources as we, as we had. And we designed this kind of theoretical model of how you could actually close all these different material cycles, provide all your energy, deal with all your wastewater, and really create this model of what a circular city might look like. Um, so this was the render that the architects made of what the site could look like with all the different houseboats. And um, it was really crazy because I had just started Metabolic uh, right before getting involved in this project. We did this theoretical study, and then two months um, into the project, it was clear that this was actually going to get built. So right after we finished the report, which was what I, what I had been used to doing up to that point, the architect said, uh, came to us and said, like, okay, guys, it's time to build. And that's, um, and that's what we had to do. So 
This is the first houseboat that we got for one euro. It was probably worth more than that, but um, <laughs> that's what we paid for it. It wasn't in great shape. Um, we were really excited. We didn't even know what was coming to us at this point because it was a massive challenge. We very quickly had to go from just being a uh, a analytical company to a construction company. So we, we got this warehouse space, we started stockpiling materials from all over the Netherlands. We were getting like old mattresses because we thought maybe we can use them for insulation. We thought we could use mushroom uh, waste as, as another type of insulation material. So we were li really like testing a lot of things out. Um, we designed our own sensor systems and sensor kits because one of the big things was that we wanted to monitor all the resource flows, so temperature, humidity, um, but also energy use, um, water use, etc. So we did a lot of tinkering with our own sort of sensor kits. We designed and built all of the different clean tech systems. So this is the community actually helping us build the Helophyte filters, so the, the wastewater treatment filters that, that actually treat the wastewater for all the buildings. And finally, there was the crazy moment when all the boats, which we had been retrofitting on the water because of some legal technicalities, had to get moved onto the land by crane. And we had the crane for two days. We had a very small budget. And actually, this boat, uh, this first one that got moved, we had to figure out how to cut it in half in 36 hours. So we had all these guys going back and forth to the rental store trying to get sharper and sharper saws and blow torches to figure out how to get this thing in two pieces. There's a great video of that online. So um, it, was a, it was a crazy process to actually get this thing built um, right after the craning happened. So this starts to look a little bit like the render. Um, these are all the boats placed on the land. And this is actually what the curve will look like on an average summer day today. It has become an intense uh, hotspot for all kinds of um, activity and uh, mostly beer drinking, I have to say. But um, it, it's a place where you can come and actually see these, uh, these things in, in the flesh. Um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, though. So, for example, we set up this whole research program to look at water and waste management, together with a lot of partners in the city. Um, and this is a picture of struvite. I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but on, on the Curvel, we actually collect urine separately so that we can extract phosphorus from it. And uh, urine um, is actually one of the best sources of chemical phosphorus, which is a critical resource for food production. And right now, there's only m most of the mines in the world that are extracting phosphorus are in Morocco, and we are actually going to run out of this resource. So on the curve, we also have a urine pipeline and a phosphorus extraction uh, uh, reactor. So as a result of this, uh, all of this stuff going on with Decoval, and it was, I have to say, a massive effort, uh, two years of really intense work trying to get all this stuff and like learning how to prototype and build all sorts of systems that we had never dealt with before because we just had, had to find solutions. Um, the whole issue came of, okay, now what? How do we scale this thing up to have a larger impact? And this was at an event in Amsterdam um, where we were discussing water innovation in the city. And at this event, the idea came to actually take the principles behind Decoval and apply them to a much larger area. Of course, it's not that you want to do exactly that thing. You're never going to have little houseboats um, in, a, in a whole, uh, uh, well, community. But uh, what we wanted to do was take the ideas behind it, the ideas of a, of a circular economy that engages citizens bottom up. And so this is a picture of Amsterdam's waste flows in, a, in the current state, what they look like. And this is an analysis that we did showing how all of those could be closed in, in uh, loops, even using current technologies. And based on the meeting that we had that day, we launched this uh, project for uh, circular, uh, called Circular Bauxloterham. So that Bauxloterham is the name of the neighborhood in which De Keuvel is located, this shipyard. Um, and this was the project where we actually be were able to translate those principles uh, to a much larger area. So this is what Bauxloterham looks like. It's a former very uh, industrial zone that's now um, looks more like this. Actually, now it looks more like a construction zone because uh, what's, what's going on is this, this whole area is really where Amsterdam is expanding. There's a ton of people arriving every year. Um, and this whole place has a lot of 
problems because it's mixed ownership, it's uh, industrial and commercial and residential, there's polluted soils, etc. So it's, it's a real opportunity to reimagine how you can actually develop part of a city uh, close to the city center. So I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but we did a lot of modeling to look at what currently is going on in, the, uh, in this part of the city. Um, and De Coeville is uh, like right here in this little corner. Um, so we looked at what's currently going on, what the situation would look like over uh, a certain period, like 20 years. Um, and based on this, we were able to develop roadmaps for actually achieving these circular ambitions uh, concretely and in an affordable way for all of those categories that I mentioned in the uh, circular uh, city objectives. And a lot of that also involves um, engaging people in a different way and having different models of governance. But this map in particular shows how that whole area can get to energy neutrality by 2035. Okay. And just very quickly, finally what we were able to do once we had this bigger plan in place was then translate those lessons back to specific housing developments in the area. So just in the last year, we worked on this project called Schonschip, which is actually uh, a, com a great community of people who decided that they wanted to live in a different way. They didn't want to be dependent on centralized resources, and they wanted to figure out how to do this themselves. Um, and we actually designed the sustainability plan also around these principles of circular development for this community. Um, there's a lot of these uh, detailed goals, but we translated those detailed goals into instructions for the architects, so for what they, could, what, what they should actually build and design for each of the houses. So this is the kind of uh, translation that we came up with. So I guess the, the thing is that these ideas, you know, it may seem like they're, they're vague or they're cute or uh, not, not applicable, but once you start, um, you get to really concrete practical applications that you can then start to scale up and, and start uh, really proving that they work on different scales. And it's just about showing people that this is actually possible and financially feasible. So, just to end with some final um, thoughts, uh, we do have uh, a choice in how uh, the, the world gets shaped moving forward and how cities look. I ran into this picture online, I don't even know how actually, but when I saw it I was really horrified because I, it, it, obviously you guys can see what this is, it's like uh, the earth is gone and it's just a rat's nest of highways, um, I guess. Um, and the, you know, th this is sometimes what I feel uh, L LA is turning into when I <laughs> look at it from, um, from the aerial view. And this is obviously not what we want. We don't want to develop cities in this way. What we need to be doing is really looking at how to bring in different types of technologies that engage citizens, that allow for different types of feedback, that allow for rapid prototyping and innovation, um, bring in green space, etc and actually create the circular cities of the future. And this is within everyone's control. There's all sorts of um, tools and contributions that everyone can, can develop. And this picture shows a kind of summary of all the different techniques that we can bring into play. And how will that look? Maybe it'll look like uh, this kind of uh, fantasy city. Maybe we'll have rural areas that are more like Hobbitville. <laughs> um, there's different ways that you can actually conceptualize how a sustainable urban future will look like. But um, one of the, the key things that we believe um, in our work at Metabolic is that we need to consider this, all of these problems from a systems perspective, that we really need to understand that they're all interconnected and that there isn't one unilateral solution. We need to continuously delve into that complexity and only with the power of tech and actually software do we finally have the tools to really do that properly. So. Um, I really look forward to seeing what comes out of the challenges that you guys are going to be working on. Uh, I, I think it's awesome to have so many brains all focused on these issues for such a long period of time. And uh, I hope I get to uh, talk to you all, or some of you, after, after this event. Thanks.